lights on. Nice wish. Very nice. Very bad. Very bad. Someone turn the lights off, please. Thank you. And these too. to the memory and imagination session. Uh, my, na my name is Christopher Wilson. Uh, I will be presenting on Monday, the 29th in the afternoon, so I'll give a little plug for my presentation. Um, but today we have um, uh, four presenters, uh, as it says in the program here. We're going to start with Sanem Yazajoğlu, coming from uh, Istanbul University, Department of Philosophy. And I won't go through um, what it says already in your program here. You can read about that. So we're going to welcome Sanem. This is not Sanem's presentation. Lights, please. I'll go turn the, I'll go turn the lights on. Puts it, 
every external perception has its not only genuinely perceived sides, but also meant, but not yet perceived, only anticipated sides. This external and possible perception of the objects, which give, give us both actualized or anticipated collection of our experience. Husserl calls all possible experience of an object the horizontal structure of our experience. This co-intended but not the objectified structure is kept by the consciousness within the relation of other possible contents of a new experience. The horizontal structure of experience necessarily has an intrinsic connection to temporality. The collection of our possible perceptions, which can be anticipated but not, yet, yet, uh, but not realized or already gained, are dependent upon future and past experiences. Here in this context, the horizontal structure of my intention is accompanied by the temporal experience of an object or the world in general. The phenomenological, uh, phenomenological investigation of the continuity of time has a particular importance in Husserl's theory. In his, especially in his work in uh, 1978, is an example of a peculiar breaking up within homogeneous time. According to him, the flow of time is represented by a flow of successive points of time. The past, present, and future do not possess the same nature as the past and the future do not come into being in time, but rather come into being in the consciousness of time. Thus, in cell in construction, consciousness seems to be blown up by now, and the stream of time is divided into consecutive now, nows in the retentional, potential perspective. A very clear example for Husserl's lectures of time consciousness, in order to show the connection of our time consciousness and conscious act, is, as, as is well known, based on considering a melody. A melody can only be perceived when it is perceived as a whole. In other words, it requires a unified intentional act. For Husserl, this activity is not a function of our imagination, which has been proclaimed before his successors, but should be explained in terms of memory and expectation. Every moment of perception includes primal impression in the connection of retention to past phases of a perceptual act and protention of future phases of the act, as Husserl says, I'm quoting, each such momentary perception is the nuclear phase of a continuity of a momentary graded retentions on the one side, and a horizon of what is becoming on the other side, a horizon of protention, which is disclosed to be characterized as a constantly graded coming. Quotation ends. When it is considered from this perspective, as Husserl calls it, the constantly running of the non phase is the core of our time consciousness. The continual flow of the relating phases con constitutes the awareness of consciousness, and therefore it gives us each moment of the intentional act. Thus, an intentional act makes it possible to perceive an, ob perceive an object as a whole, like a melody, and but by continually relating this act to a transcendent object, it gives us the possibility of identifying the object as the same object throughout a temporal, temporal series of impressions. As the foregoing remarks suggest, retention is a different kind of memory to that of the act of recollection. Retention is always a component of ordinary presentation of an object, whereas recollection is always dependent upon it, and it occurs as a derivative mode of the first experience. In other words, recollection can be understood as a returning back to the past experience. For this reason, Husserl makes a difference in between two kinds of memory, where he calls retention as the primary memory and the recollection as the secondary memory. The act of rec 
collection gives us the opportunity to consider a particular now among consequential series of time. Thus, it becomes possible for the consciousness to consider now in a numerous times as long as it can be an object to the intentional act. This highly sophisticated analysis I have outlined here is, the, is of particular importance to my presentation, both from the perspectives of primary and secondary memory, as the first one gives us the possibility of perceiving things as a whole, whereas the second represents the stable point in successive points in a lived experience. Now I'm coming to the second part. Collective memory. Husserl's analysis of the constitution of the world deals not only with the constitution of material things, but also the animated body. Animated body, or a person, is always a part of an environment, and the environment is the world which sustains the objects in remembering or forgetting, or any other activities one can be directed towards. Thus, the objective reality of the world cannot allow us to consider it as an object in itself, but on the contrary, it becomes an object for the self. A person or a subject never finds herself, himself, alone in an environment, and as, as is clear, clearly expressed by Alfred Schutz, without the presence of the others together with us, Neither a common environment as the counterpart of the intentional interconnectedness of conscious life, nor an understanding for ourself, uh, ourselves and for others is possible. As is well known, con continuous train of thought on this theme can be found in nearly all phenomenological works after Husserl. However, this theme of interconnectedness of our conscious life both in the sense of living in an environment and living together with others has become a highly problematic issue since the second or half of the 20th century. Among essays on the destruction of the common world, Hannah Arendt's is deserving a particular importance among them all. Although she has many similarities to Heidegger's analysis in Sein und Zeit in terms of the manifold senses of the world, Arendt distinguishes herself in her insistence upon plurality. In her essays, plurality is a human condition which occurs from an essential need, that is a need to see and to be seen by the others, which takes place in a constructed world. This essential need also need the uh, need is also the only possibility of producing not only words and deeds, by speaking and acting, but also objects of the world which guarantee the endurance of the world without, I'm quoting, stabilizing and solidifying influence of objects. The world can never be a reliable home for man. On that point, it might be helpful to remember Arendt's distinction between the use of youth objects and works of art works of art, which she says, works of art are the most intensely worldly of all tangible things. Their durability is almost untouched by the corroding effect of natural process. Today, we might discuss the distinction by considering contemporary art, but at the heart of her emphasis, there is a more decisive point for our discussion. Because of their perishing due to use, Use objects lack, uh, lack the ability to construct a world. Beneath this, artistic objects, by transcending mortal life and surpassing it over the centuries, are objects of remembrance. As she points out, I'm quoting, nowhere else does the sheer durability of the world of things appear in such a purity and clarity. Nowhere else, therefore, does this thing world reveal itself so spectacularly as the non-mortal home for mortal beings. Even if it is a huge object or an object of art, as Arendt puts it in a higher order, without reification and materialization, thought process 
could never prevent itself from perishing, a permanent, a permanent perishing from the recollection of humanity. Moreover, the real sense of being together with others, i.e. speaking and acting with others, needs help of homophobash in its highest capacity. I'm quoting from Arendt again. That is the help of artists, of poets, and historiographers, of monument builders, builders or writers, because without them, the only product of their activity, the story they enact and tell, would not survive at all. I believe there is no need to explain that the story which is enacted and told is the history itself. History, in that sense, depends on two essential structures. The first is the collective production, and the second is the people who will remember and tell it. Without the collective memory, the story would never become a common story and would always lose its representative quality of plurality of ideas. On this point, we might recall what Husserl uh, calls the world horizon, a concept which undoubtedly includes the unity of the flow of experience, obviously includes the whole of the experiences that can be thematized in this way. The thing character of the world and its being a subject to the intentional act can be reconsidered according to the relation of created objects and their quality of representing collective memory once again. As we might conclude, collective memory is an interconnected secondary memory which depends on recollection of the past lived experiences. I have already mentioned the relation of primary and secondary memory. Then the question arises, do we really have the possibility of creating a collective memory today? This is the thir third and the last chapter. When will it be now? Beginning with such an unusual and paradoxical question is not too far from our daily experiences. And I believe it directly corresponds to our contemporary perception of time. As, as it has been subjected to in the last decades, the disca discussion of uh, alienation both from the world and the earth can be reinterpreted in, the, in terms of memory. In the midst of infinite manifoldness of things, opportunities, events, or sometimes people, a finite being who has a beginning and end naturally has difficulties in confronting them all. The reflection of this destructive diversity to the subjective lives shows itself mostly in the form of forgetfulness. But the real treat for the collective memory is not directly based on forgetfulness itself, but from the other achievements of homo homophobic, who uses technology to adjust or transform our subjective memory into a so-called backup memory. From that moment on, every object immediately loses its quality to be an object ready, be, ready to be directed towards here and now, but an object of potential future intentional act. The removal of the spatio-temporal experience and its reversal of a potential and secured backup experience perhaps has perhaps never been as destructive for our experiences and for the world itself as it is for today. As, a long, uh, as long as thousands of photographs gives us the opportunity to consider our particular now among consequential series of time, for example, the, for example, the complete process of our holiday, recollection becomes useless. Every production bears the footprint of its, create, the, its creator, and the producer or the creator never produces an object without an environment or without others with whom she or he is living in a particular time. As long as these are the constituents of, uh, of a subject of understanding, Godemar's words are decisive on this point. I'm quoting. 
Understanding is to be thought of less as a subjective act than as participating in an event of tradition without the process of transmission in which past and present are constantly mediated. The basic acceptance of, uh, and, and quotation ends, the basic, this basic acceptance of hermeneutic theory, which mediates past and future in terms of any, of any understanding and its transfiguration as an object, gives us the basic ground of what Gadamer calls as fusions of horizons. Without the presence of the object to confront, it is not possible to confront the horizon of the past lived experiences. And without remembering them, them uh, preserving the entrance of the world becomes impossible. Nothing could give us the reality of the world more than the things we, give, uh, we have had contact with for centuries. Today, we may, we, today, what we have lost is the continuity of the conscious experience. The plastic structure of anything we have met gives us the enchantment of doing a new and a better thing without considering the temporal representation of a thing. Of course, it can endure 50 years or 80 years, which is still too long for our mostly five seconds of advertising modeling daily experiences. As I pass in front of Hagia Sophia and Blue Mosque every day on my way to work, I have a chance to encounter the 1,500-year-old consciousness of two architects, Isidore of Miletus and Anthemius of Trales, and the 550 years old architect, Sinan, three months in which their world and culture are reflected. As a last remark, I will point out uh, are the most crucial forgetfulness of our lives. This is not only the forgetfulness of our living experience of the now, but also, and as a result of the previous one, the ability to produce and durable things and topographies of remembrance where they dwell. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Sanem, for um, quite a, a concise grounding now. Um, we're going to move to Adam Shar. I can do that. Okay. Uh, Adam is joining us from Cardiff University in Wales. And actually, when I had a chance of reviewing the papers for this uh, session, Whoever organized it, I can compliment you right now because it's a, it's a nice shift back and forth between um, some kind of theoretical grounding and then Adam here is going to bring it, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, and more concrete into, he's going to explain a, a building in Berlin. Just turn the lights out so you can look at the slides rather than me, which would be much more interesting. Arguably, Berlin is the capital of memoriams. I uh, get those images. Heinrich Tessenhoff's rebuilding of Schinkel's Neuerwache, complete with the figure by Kate Kolwitz, the memorial to the murdered Jews of Europe, by, designed by Peter Eisenman, and the Jewish Museum by Daniel Liebskind, are among numerous statements of civic atonement prominent in the fabric of the city. I'll do it. Okay, next one. This paper considers a building that offers, in my view, some of the richest lessons of the post-war Berlin memorials. This is the Chapel of Reconciliation, which is in the district of Wedding near the old Nordbahnhof, and it's located in what was once no man's land between the two leaves of the Berlin Wall. Opened in 2000, it replaces a church on the same site, which was spectacularly detonated by the GDR military in 1985, because it obstructed their lines of sight and of shot. Next slide. 
While standing on the foundations of its predecessor, the recent building is completely different in plan, section and architectural expression. I'm going to interpret the details of the chapel in order to explore and, inter in, and recount the tactics for memorialisation which are evident there. The first church on the site was completed in 1895, built in neo-Gothic style and polychromatic brickwork. Constructed to serve immigrant communities seeking work in this district of Berlin, it was named the Church of Reconciliation in reflection of contemporary social tensions surrounding that immigration. The church was damaged by aerial bombardment in 1943. In 1950, when it reopened, Bernauerstrasse, onto which it faced, had become the border of the Russian-administered sector of Berlin. Next slide. As Cold War tensions escalated and the city was partitioned in August 1961, the church became stranded between the walls. Buildings around it were removed, but the church was sealed up. I know it's a very small image, but you can just about make out the fact that it's been the church has been kind of walled into the provisional wall. Um, next slide. Film footage of the steeple's detonation in January 1985 was broadcast worldwide. The Chancellor of West Germany at that time, Helmut Kohl, described the detonation of this church as a symbol of the distance between East and West that was yet to be overcome. Following the literal and metaphorical fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989, the congregation discovered the foundations of their church intact and traced relics of the building, including the font, the altar bible, the reredos, which was damaged, and the church's bells. An architectural competition was organised for a replacement for a small modern chapel in the spirit of reconciliation in which the church was first founded. Next slide, please. The competition was won by young Berlin architects Reitemann and Sassenrod. Their proposal was overlaid on part of the remaining foundations. Next slide. The building is organised as two ovals in plan, one contained within the other. The sanctuary, the inner oval, is enclosed by massively thick walls and is lit only from above. The outer oval is twisted in geometry with respect to the inner one and provides a space of reflection between the entrance and the sanctuary. Next slide. This outer oval is not only enclosed, is, is not enclosed but open to the air, separated from the ground by closely spaced vertical louvers. It has a slightly provisional feel, not inside or outside, and its purpose seems ambiguous. Next slide. The inner sanctuary space is reached through a metal box, a kind of airlock in the enclosing thick wall which projects so that it's visible from the entrance to the ambulatory. Next slide. Passing through this box, next slide, visitors turn to face two altars, or rather a new altar and the memory of an old one. A simple stone cube placed at 45 degrees, and then at 90 degrees the salvaged reredos from the first church hung in a niche. The cube and the reredos imply two axes within the asymmetrical oval. Care is taken to ensure that these axes have an equivalent presence in the building. The dominance of the axis implied by the niche is subverted by the laying out of chairs parallel to the altar cube and by the placement of the square roof light. Study of the plan shows that the reredos and its niche are placed directly on the axis of the first church, although their new site was previously done at the location at the back of the nave. Next slide. Glazed openings in the floor expose the footings of the first church and debris from the bombing of 1943. An information leaflet produced by the chapel reports fierce discussions between client and architect's design stage. The architects proposed that the massive enclosing wall of the sanctuary be made of reinforced concrete and that the louvers enclosing the ambulatory be cut from glass. The congregation and their representatives felt that these materials were too militaristic, too close to the materials of the walls and the watchtowers which once divided the site. After protracted debate, timber was substituted for glass, and round earth, a material which, as I'm sure you all know, comprises compacted loam, stony aggregate and flax fibres, was substituted for concrete. And these late changes, it seems to me, enriched the building hugely. Next slide. Many of Berlin's prominent contemporary memorials seek meaning by dealing in presences and in absences. Or more specifically, by dealing in physical presences which stand for past absences, and physical absences which stand for past presences. This tactic involves a phenomenological appeal to material substance, using the power of manifestly unnegotiable fabric to, dis to disclose what was once in existence. 
For example, Eisenman's Holocaust Memorial, first conceived with Richard Serra, comprises a grid of 2,711 of these concrete stellae. Toughly inscrutable companions, fellow mourners resolute in silence, they give a sense of preventing you occupying their space. Describing, in that way, lost presences, people, lives and buildings which were once part of this world. But the material muteness of the blocks is also a kind of absence, open to accept multiple projections of meaning. I would contend that the Chapel of Reconciliation also seeks meaning through devices of presence and absence. Right, next slide. Sedimented together in the chapel are multiple layers of presence and absence, of which I could run through four. The first layer involves axis and symmetry. A single central axis con connecting together entrance and altar, the basic organising device of a conventional cruciform planned Christian church is conspicuously absent here. Instead, the axis is broken and made multiple. The entrance to the sanctuary isn't obvious as one enters the ambulatory, and visitors are presented with not one but two axes when they turn to in enter the inner room, neither of which is dominant. A single axis is conventionally a centre of symmetry, and, although the oval is potentially a symmetrical figure, symmetry is always resisted in the design of the chapel. To start with, neither outer nor inner oval are actually quite symmetrical. Then, when each oval is broken for entrances and niches, these breaks are always placed to resist symmetry. The possibility of symmetry and its denial are conspicuous, palpable absences for the visitor. On one level, these absences serve to highlight the loss and one-time presence of the chapel's conventionally organised predecessor. On another, they stand as a clear critique of its architectural tradition. Singularity becomes questionable in a post-war world where the Holocaust and the mechanised warfare of world wars and cold war might be seen as the logical conclusion of European reason and progress, where they might be understood as a termination of the modernists' quest for a unified truth. In this context, complexities and multiplicities offer more. The possibilities of axis are not denied. The trace of the single axis is clearly there as an absent presence, but it's definitively, re uh, definitively relocated in the past. Next slide. Second, the ambulatory is curiously enigmatic. It can be thought of as a substitute for the arcaded or colonnaded side aisles of a conventional church. Yet, unlike side aisles, it yields nothing of the interior of, of nave or sanctuary for the visitor because it's separated from the sanctuary by a massive wall. It might also be thought of as a cloister. However, rather than an inward focus on a garden, it has an outward focus to the surrounding scrubland which was once lethally contained between two leaves of Berlin Wall. Partly because it's open to the air and the noise of traffic, this space is no easy place to linger in. Again, the presence of this space draws attention to absences, to the detonated church and its architectural traditions, to a lack of comfortable fami familiarity, and to the once charged void between the walls. Its outward orientation resists in an easy introversion. Okay, next slide. The third layer of presence and absence evident in the Chapel of Reconciliation involves the altar, and the lack of an altar implied by the Reredos in its niche. The altar is, of course, the centre of ritual in a conventionally ordered church. In this instance, it's doubled and then subtracted. The stone cube altar is the first object on view when entering the sanctuary, although visitors find it obliquely. It sits on a plinth of similarly polished stone that's flush with the floor. No raised dais here. The platonic geometry of the cube and its lack of decoration lends an almost prehistoric quality to its knowing minimalism. This altar has a decisive presence in the space that's also curiously undermined by its almost provisional placement in the room. The presence of this altar is doubly undermined by its silent second. The reredos in the niche to its right, the only decorated object in an otherwise hair-shirt space, is an arresting presence. Its symmetrical placement in its niche, its glazed opening below to the remains of the former church, and its obvious origin as a backdrop to an altar, make the lack of altar in front of it all the more apparent. The central presence of the altar cube used for ceremonies is curiously rendered almost absent by its mute companion. And the absence of an altar in front of the niche, combined with the intricately worked relic of the salvaged reredos, manifest very presently the church that was. Okay, next slide. Fourthly, the round earth walls of the sanctuary speak powerfully of the lost building and its resurrection. 
The building technique used involves compacting together loam, aggregate and fibres under high pressure within temporary formwork. Walls are built up in successive pools. Although the, resist the resulting wall appears substantial, it is in fact rather delicate. Most intriguing about the round earth wall of the chapel is its aggregate though. Sifted from the site, it includes fragments of masonry, stone and tile from the original church. On close examination, it's possible to make out glazed faces once part of that building's decoration and multiple colours of brick from its walls. Can you leave it in there? Sorry. Too quick. The alluvial presence of these million fragments, reconstituted together in a new substance, is a powerful token of the absent church as a whole, of the once singular assurance of its epoch's worldview. Moreover, the round earth literally sediments together countless deposits of memory into built form, layer by layer. Each fragment, each member of the aggregate, is an individual with its own enigmatic presence. Where did it come from? What are the many stones now buried invisibly in the depth of the wall? Each deposit is a totem for the many millions of memories of the violent end of the original church and all that it stood and fell for. These four layers of presence and absence are residues of memory sedimented together in the built form of the chapel. Drawing on the idea of sedimentation, I'm going to go on to consider why these tactics comprise a distinctive way of evoking memory with respect to other approaches to making memorials. Eisenman's memorial and Liebskin's Jewish Museum are singular projects. Because of the singular atrocity of the Holocaust that they both memorialise in different ways, the project's intellectual reasoning serves to unsight their architectural fabric as much as to cite it. The projects the, the project seek experiences which wrench visitors away from the specifics of the site, rather than to locate them there. This deliberately runs counter to another, more widespread tactic for making memory apparent in architectural reform, which recurs in canonical architectural projects in the post-war era. Next slide. In Peter Zumthor's recent reworking of a ruined church in Cologne, new fabric is built onto old in such a way as to make the layers of history apparent, one on top of the next. Likewise, Sverafen's Haymar Museum and Carlo Scarpa's famously opportunistic historical reconstruction of the Castelvecchio in Verona. This tactic is manifestly archaeological. Each new layer is constructed on the previous one. Each is made visible in order to present a story about a sequence of events. In this tactic, the building serves to fulfil a teleological archaeology. One thing on top of the next, one thing after another. Next slide. I would contend that the Chapel of Reconciliation does not stand as a teleological archaeology, but rather as a sedimentary one by which I mean that the building form sifts together the layers of presence and absence by which memory is evoked there in a more integral, more compressed way than would be achieved by building explicitly layer on layer. There are moments that express a historical building sequence on the site, like the glass panels that open up glimpses of remains below, but for the most part the chapel's form embodies a more complex approach. Next slide. Walter Benjamin's notion of archaeology contributes here. He who wishes to approach his own buried past must act, must act like a man who digs. Facts of the matter are only deposits, layers which deliver only to the most meticulous examination what constitutes the true assets hidden within the earth. And in order to dig successfully, a plan is certainly required. Yet just as indispensable is the spade's careful, probing penetration of the dark earthen realm. And he who only keeps the inventory of his finds, but not also this dark bliss of the finding itself, cheats himself of the best part. The unsuccessful search belongs to it as fully as the fortunate search. This is why memory must not proceed by way of narrative, much less by way of reports, but must rather assay, and I had to look that word up, it means test the ingredients and quality of it, its spade, epically and rhapsodically in the most rigorous sense. So what Benjamin's doing is to distinguish artefacts from the ideas attributed to them considering them to be talismans of insight whose authority derives from the reverence in which they're held. But artefacts are only as important as the search for them. Benjamin evokes the thrill of the chase, but also a find and loss. He implies that each individual is at the centre of their own ongoing archaeology. This pursuit becomes meaningful where the individual is able to weigh up their finds, or their lack of them, to ground the value of their own memories in relation to present or imagined material remains. These presences, whether they're actually found or not, are also earthen absences, opportunities for individuals to project their memories onto them and to measure their memories against them. 
Okay, two slides on. Next one. Um, sorry, can you go back one? Mistake. This <laughs> wall represents the ta architectural tactics of the chapel as a whole, this round earth wall. It serves as a metaphor for the chapel's sedimentations of presence and absence. The multiplication of axis and denial of symmetry, the doubling and subtraction of altars, the opening of a reconstituted side aisle outward rather than inward, demonstrate neither an absolute rejection nor a clear acceptance of architectural traditions and all the meaning with which those traditions are loaded. Instead, the fabric of the chapel embodies a matrix of memorial residues. With the ambulatory, with the axes, with the altars, Architectural traditions are disaggregated and re-aggregated, sedimented back together all at once in a new mix. They're there, recognisable but changed, recombined and resettled. Their order is not a neat one. It describes no teleological layering, but instead a more ambiguous reconstitution. The power of this reconstitution lies in its potential to ask visitors to act as Benjaminian archaeologists, to seek projections of their own memories in the building's conspicuously present and absent constituents, to reach a new settlement with their expectations, and to sediment their memories anew. This sedimentary archaeology stands as a powerful exemplar for the evocation of memory in architectural form, it seems to me. The chapel is not as singular as the memorials to trauma designed by Leapskin and Eisenman, which seek to make somewhere manifestly other. Andreas Heusen, in his book Present Pasts, writes that while trauma is a decisive mode of memorialisation, it can be too enclosed. It can sometimes struggle to allow reconciliation. The chapel offers a rich middle way between a highly singular approach and the more teleological view of archaeology, which renders one thing more or less equivalent to the next. The chapel's form suggests a particular position. That the divisions of, Cold War comprise, the divisions of war and Cold War comprise a break with the past, that nothing can be the same afterwards, but that the break is not a total rupture. What went before should be acknowledged but not taken for granted, tradition should be disaggregated but not dismissed, and a new settlement should be constituted. Its strength, the chapel, is in its constitutive re-aggregation of artefacts, making them structural and, in the spirit of Benjamin's archaeology, making them ambiguous enough to allow for projections of memory. The Chapel of Reconciliation implies neither a refutation of tradition nor an easy resort to historicist revival. It allows for the thoughtful resettlement of traditions in a different time.